Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy here for your daily dose of the roars as I scream about the very, very stupid stuff going on in the modern world of technology so I can earn some of that dirty YouTube money so I can uh, so I can uh, pay for Silicon Dojo. Authorityless, gatekeepers, free the indies, or hands-on technology education that empowers you to do whatever the hell it is you want to do here, here in Durham, North Carolina. I'm on location at American Underground today because I'm teaching a class on extending AI capabilities using REST APIs tonight. If you're interested in these types of classes, take a look at silicondojo.com. If you want to help support these types of classes, there's a donor box link down below. And with that, let me just say, let me just start this by saying they're not factories. They're not factory. Whatever the fuck they are, they're not Fucking factories, AI factories. Uh, anyways, I'm really starting to get tired of the tech world taking words that they like and then using them for whatever the hell they want to use them for. But I do think that this is an interesting story. Uh, basically, you know, what, what is old is new again. This is a big thing that happens in the technology world, right? When I was a kid, mainframes were the big deal, and then personal computers came out and it became uh, client server architecture. And then back in the 2000s, application servers came back and thin clients came back. And all of a sudden, people were realizing that mainframes were actually good architecture style. And then that was, you know, 15 years ago. So that architecture style died again. And, you know, we're, we're going along. So I think one of the interesting things to look at is how, uh, like, architecture styles kind of come and go. It's one of the reasons I, I get so frustrated when I see technology professionals get married uh, around some concept, right? Whether it's a programming language or whether it's an architecture style, the idea is this is the way to do it and the other way is stupid. And it's like, no. <laughs> And there are, certain, there are certain time periods where things make sense. And then surprise, surprise, life moves on. Shit changes. So anyways, I think this is interesting because it does look like we are reverting back to a world where on-premises uh, data centers not factories, data centers are actually just taking, making a lot more sense, right? So over the past 15 years, with the rise of AWS and Azure, DigitalOcean, these companies, more and more of the servers have resided literally up on the cloud, up on the public cloud. But now there are a lot of interesting things going on where people want to bring that technology technology back in-house. Everything from, from spying and espionage uh, to regulatory compliance. We see a lot and more, a lot more uh, rules and laws around data sovereignty. The idea is that the data about French citizens citizens should simply remain in France. It's not even that Microsoft deals with it or Facebook deals with it, but the data itself needs to remain in a particular geographic area. And so what's interesting now, so you have these big companies, right? You have the Amazons of the world, the Azures of the world, and say so they've built all this cloud infrastructure, but now people want that, that cloud infrastructure. They, they want the resources of that cloud infrastructure, but they want to host it locally. And so now we're starting to see companies like Amazon start to come up with products so the products can run locally within people's own uh, local infrastructure. And this is coming from uh, TechCrunch. Uh, Amazon challenges competitors with on-premises NVIDIA AI factories. <laughs> They're not factories. They just, I just, like, they're not factories. Anyways, Amazon announced a new product Tuesday called AI Factories. Mm. that allows big corporations and governments to run its AI systems in their own data centers, or as AWS puts it, customers supply the power and the data center, and AWS plunks in the AI system, manages it, and can tie it into other AWS cloud services. So basically, the, fi the physical boxes are now on your premise, but the interesting thing is Amazon is still managing it. Which is one of those things you really have to think about when you start talking about risk mitigation and risk tolerance is if people outside of your organization still have access to the systems that are inside your organization, how much risk have you mitigated? Like there's this weird thing. Like I remember this with uh, when cloud computing became the big deal. And oh, so the old the old school computer, computer repair people are like, I would never trust the cloud. The, the cloud is insecure. And you're like, jackasses. Look, as, as, soon as, you, as soon as you plug that network cable into your computer, it's on the cloud. All uh, internet connected systems are on the cloud. 
really when you're talking about cloud computing the question is, is simply where is the physical box located right and so it was really interesting there was a lot of people out there and they're like i would never trust the cloud and you're like dude your systems are on the cloud <laughs> and again i've had employees i've had tech employees <laughs> Who, who do you trust more? Your tech employees that you're paying 20 or 30 bucks an hour or Azure's or Amazon's tech employees that they're paying 100 bucks an hour, right? The reality is, is when it comes to security and all that kind of stuff, most likely, most cases, Amazon and Azure is going to be better. Now, I know some jackass, jackasses that are out there are going to be like, well, well, Region 1, AWS Region 1 just failed because of DynamoDB. Y yeah. <laughs> Oh, Craigie. <laughs> it's, I don't know. I don't know how to explain things to people. It's like, actually run your own systems. Run your own systems and be honest. Be honest about your own downtime. And then look at the downtime that comes from using cloud services. And many times what you'll find out is you have you have far less downtime with the cloud services. The other nice thing is when you go with cloud services is when something does fail, there's nothing you can do about it. Right, when your exchange server fails, when your exchange server, your exchange server drops, you're responsible for it. It means you're going to be working 24 hours a day until that fucker is back up and running. Here's a nice thing. Office 365 drops for whatever reason. <laughs> CEO comes into your office, emails down. And you're like, yes, Microsoft knows about it. I will keep you informed. And then you sip a cup of coffee and you watch your Netflix video, right? Right? Isn't that a much better way to live? Anyways, I think that's one of the things. Like when we went from when we went from like the local infrastructure to the cloud, I think a lot of people just don't really understand how the internet works. <laughs> it doesn't matter where it's at. J just because you can physically see your box does not like somehow make it more secure. Like there's this weird human thing. Like if I see it, it is more secure. And to be clear, <laughs> to be clear, having a consultant a consulting company in Baltimore City, Baltimore City. I can tell you, just because you can see your box, it does not make it more secure. If the crackhead comes in and steals your server so that they can get another hit of heroin, that is not more secure. But anyways, uh, so I think one of the, the curious things now, as we, we flip it on its head, as we flip it on its head, now starting to bring, bring systems back, back in uh, to your in-house data centers. Again, there's this idea, because I can see it, because it's on premises, right? Because I can see it. Now, now we have mitigated risks. And a big question to ask yourself is, is have you, or actually have you, have you added a tremendous amount of risk? Are you doing security theater at the exact same time you're jeopardizing your own infrastructure? And this is something uh, to consider. It's also something to think about as you start to bring things more, quote unquote, in-house. Do you want to bring it, bring it in-house to your facility or do you want to go to something like a co-location facility? Like a co-location facility is basically where you rent space in somebody else's data center. So maybe you go to a data, maybe you go to a data center with backup power, backup uh, internet connections, all of that kind of stuff. But you, you pay enough money that you get those nice, like, nice chain link fence inside the data center. So that's your physical facility inside their data center so it's like you bring it in you bring it off of amazon but then you host it in a co-location facility like there's there's a lot there's there's a lot of risk uh to running your own systems locally again being an ad being in Asheville, north carolina let me tell you like when you're in the mountains of western north carolina you too can get hit by a fucking hurricane <laughs> that gives you a biblical flood there are many environmental concerns we had about Asheville, North Carolina. Biblical floods was nowhere on that list, yet we still got hit by them. So again, those are some of the things uh, to kind of be thinking about. But anyways, um, uh, the idea is to cater to companies and governments concerned with data sovereignty or absolute control over their data so it can't wind up in a competitor's or foreign adversary's hands. But again, think about this for a second. Think about this for a second. So we want absolute control of our data, but Amazon is still going to manage it. Do you actually have absolute control of your data or do you have security theater? And remember... Talking to business people here, talking to consultants here. Sometimes you sell the theater. <laughs> Sometimes you sell the product. A lot of times you sell the theater. Something to think about. 
An on-prem AI factory means not sending their data to a model maker and not even sharing the hardware, which is true. So the physical boxes remain locally, so you're not sharing the hardware. Again, a big question there, does that actually matter? And you're not, you're not sending that data out uh, to, to yeah, the, the, the people who create the models. Uh, the AWS factory will use a combination of AWS and NVIDIA technology. Companies that deploy these systems, and this is interesting too, can opt for NVIDIA's latest Blackwell GPUs or Amazon's new Tr Tranium 3 chip, right? So Amazon now have these ASICs chips, so everybody's using these ASICs chips. So Amazon now has their own chips called Tranium 3. And this is one of the reasons why I would get concerned about NVIDIA and the value of NVIDIA is everybody is trying to eat into NVIDIA, right? So you have Amazon or Google right now, Alphabet right now, right? And you can, you can rent NVIDIA or you can rent their TPUs. Amazon is saying you can rent NVIDIA or you can invent or you can rent uh, Tranium. And I think one of the things, what they're doing here is everybody wants NVIDIA, right? We need NVIDIA. Do you need really need NVIDIA? Probably not, but they think they need NVIDIA. So they give them the NVIDIA option and then they start explaining the value proposition of their A6 processor. And it's a very interesting way to be able to draw customers in to their particular world. Uh, it uses AWS's homegrown networking, storage, databases, and security, and can tap into Amazon Bedrock, the AI model selection and management service, and AWS SageMaker AI, the model building and training tool. Last month, Microsoft also outlined the data centers and cloud services that would be built in local countries to address the data sovereignty issue. To be fair, its options include Azure Local, Microsoft's own managed hardware that could be installed in customers' sites. So this seems to be a new thing. Uh, still, it is a bit ironic that AI is causing the biggest cloud providers to invest so heavily in corporate private data centers and hybrid clouds like it's 2009 all over again. And this is where I would disagree with TechCrunch, right? If TechCrunch actually hired real technology professionals and not simply, you know, dropouts of, uh, you know, gender studies programs at, uh, at liberal arts uh, colleges, you would realize this isn't ironic. This is literally how technology goes, right? Basically, what, what you run into in the technology world is you're always going to have bottlenecks. You're always going to have bottlenecks and you're always going to have risks. Those bottlenecks and those risks change over time, right? So back in the day, so back when I had my, when I originally started my consulting company, right? I had a DSL line. I had a DSL line, like, uh, was it 1.5, 1, 1 like 1.5 up, or no, 1.5 down, supposedly, and 7, 750, 725 or whatever up, right? Kilobits per second, kilobits per second. And so the idea back then that was I was going to run my own web server in-house didn't make any sense. So that's why you would go with a cloud provider to, buy, to do something like your web uh, website. What's interesting now, it's now 2025, uh, I have uh, AT&T fiber to the house. Not only do I have a gigabit per second fiber to the house right now, but apparently I can upgrade to five gigs per second for $250 a month. To be clear, I don't even know what I would do. Like I literally at this point, I don't know what I would do with five gigabits per second, but think about this, right? If I can do five gigabits per second to my house, then, then the bandwidth is no longer a bottleneck. So how I design my architecture is going to be fundamentally different, right? I shifted from local to the cloud because the bottleneck uh, was the ISP connection. Now the bottleneck is no longer the ISP connection. So maybe I shifted back home, right? That's that's how technology works. There is nothing ironic about this. This is just how things go. And this is something for you to be considering when you go out there and you start developing technologies, you start um, deploying technologies. One of the big things to be considering is basically where do you think things are going in the next five or 10 years? When you deploy technology today, you need to deploy, deploy technology not just for today, but for about that five year time frame. Like a five year time frame for when everything works how it's supposed to, and a 10 year time frame for kind of like extended, like make sure everything keeps working, right? Um, because again, thing, things fundamentally change. Storage price comes down. Uh, you know, different, different, different stuff happens. Um, and that's kind of one of the things you have to have to consider there. Uh, what's going to be really interesting right now is with all the geopolitical tensions going on, there's going to be a lot more push or uh, for localized things. And I think there's a lot of value proposition there simply by, by making crap local. 
right? Look, look, I, like you, you can't compete with, with Amazon uh, to building a data center, right? For for price point, for a lot of things, you can't compete with Amazon or, or or Azure or whatever else. On the other hand, you know what you look at is you don't compete on that. You compete on geographic location, right? This this is you know a a French company. This is a French company uh, that that only has data centers in France. Your data literally cannot be replicated outside of France. This is an American company. Your data cannot be replicated outside of the U.S. Right? Think thinking about selling based off of that type of thing uh, can be a very valuable proposition. And in the modern world, where regulations are going to push more companies in that direction, uh, that's like kind of something to, to keep in mind. So, what do you think about this? What do you think about Amazon? You know pushing uh, on-premises NVIDIA AI factories. What do you think about more and more of this, this on-premises world for these cloud services? Do you think it's, it's mitigating risk in the way people think it's mitigating risk? I don't know. Put your thoughts. Put your thoughts down below. If you like these videos, give us a thumbs up. If you hate these videos, give us a thumbs down. Call me amazing. Call me a dumbass. Just be a real Lutnik. Put that strong American comment down below. Uh, I am on location here at American Underground in Durham, North Carolina. I'm doing a class tonight on extending AI capabilities using REST APIs. If you're interested in coming to free to the end user hands-on technology education, education here in Durham, you can go to SiliconDojo.com to see what our current schedule is. Do remember free to the end user is not actually free. That's why I'm here. Shh. Shaking, shaking my brain, shaking my brain every day. Don't talk about the nips. People get all shy when you talk about nips. But anyways, that's why I'm here shaking my brain every day. If you want to help support the project, there's a donor box link down below. And with that, see y'all later.